Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. And welcome to Science Faction 21, the science faction that comes after 20. Ow. That's accurate. <laughs> I am your host, full-time archaeologist, part-time stand-up comedian Robert Timothy. With me, as always, our full-time biomedical research scientist, Jackie. Jackie, how are you doing today? I'm good. I, I wanted to thank both of you guys for recording a little early on my behalf so that I have time to go to the Backstreet Boys concert tomorrow night. That's right. We are recording here on a Tuesday night instead of our usual Wednesday night. World uh, revolves around you, Jackie. Don't worry. Well, Me and the Backstreet Boys. To be fair, it is more of a Backstreet Boys time constraint than Jackie's. Yeah. I couldn't get tickets. I'm hey, just jealous. Hey, they want it that way. They do want it that way. <laughs> and the way we want it is with science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. All right, and today in Science Articles, there are three very interesting things going on. Did I just forget to introduce Damien? I think you did. Yeah, okay. a little, it's a little offensive. Oh, no, I don't want to. Just go on with the show. I'm just going to be, be <laughs> passive-aggressive the whole episode. Don't worry. Yeah, oh, that's a change of pace. There's a guy who's occasionally the janitor, but he sat down and started talking on the podcast. His name is Damien. <laughs> anyway, on to Science Articles. So the first article here... Pedafantastic. <laughs> We've got a way. We Sounds just amazing. don't say that enough, you know? No, there's some you haven't heard that in a while. There's some researchers in Germany who are trying to figure out how to basically be able to pick pedophiles out of a lineup, essentially. And so they're putting them in fMRIs, which are functional magnetic resonance imaging machines. For those of you who haven't heard of them before, they basically measure where water flow is, i.e. where blood flow is in your brain, and therefore can say, see what part of your brain you're using at a certain time. Uh, we use this a lot for neurological experiments. In this case, they wanted to see what happens when people are attracted to something. So if you are a heterosexual male, you see a picture of a woman. If you're a heterosexual woman, you see a picture of a male. Same thing, vice versa. He wanted to see how people were, uh, when people saw a picture of something they were attracted to, what their brain did. So he put them in this fMRI machine with a little screen in front of them and flashed pictures. He had a couple of groups. He had heterosexuals, he had homosexuals, and then he had self-admitted pedophiles. And he in the self admitted pedophiles, he did also. Did they have to trick? Like, how did they, how'd they tease that out of him? Yeah, the pedophile yeah, part? Were, like, were they a lot like... of them were part of a big, uh, like, group home for pedophiles mm -hmm. that they sometimes get put to oh, voluntarily yeah, yeah. or sometimes as part of a punishment for a crime. Mm -hmm. And so they were working with this scientist. He put them in there and he showed, flashed across a bunch of different pictures. He'd show pictures of adult men, adult females, then children of different sexes, and then he would look at what was going on in their head. Are, there, are these s sexually suggestive images or simply... Yeah. Nope. And just how, like are, school photos. How exactly. hot are these? Okay. The school photos? Yeah, so really Or like hot. driver's license wow. or something. Yeah. No, okay. it was, it, it, think of it like a driver's license picture. So okay. very basic. What if you just... I mean, what if you're just a fan of glossy pictures? Like, that's your fetish. So... <laughs> Yeah, sure. So what they saw is that uh, men who were heterosexual and looking at, at pictures of other adults, especially women, uh, they would show activity in certain parts of their brain. And those parts of their brain then became kind of associated with their attraction. And those were certain occipital areas, uh, the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, the putnam and nucleus caudatus. I'm sure I mispronounced that horribly. Um, but they're all part of how we recognize faces and sexual behavior and all of these these type of things so we see that that is basically the baseline for what happens when you see somebody you're attracted to the same was true of the pedophiles they were able to tell that the pedophiles were attracted to the children rather than the adults based on their brain's reaction to these pictures as they were going through when they saw an adult female mm -hmm. did the pedophile did their brain just not react? Did it react it did not, in a separate area? Yeah, exactly. It did okay. not react in the part of the brain that's usually for attraction. Okay. So wait, wait, wait. wait. We, we could just scan somebody's brain, show them this image, and we'd know, we could invade their mind and know that they're a pedophile? Well, that would be the basic idea. It's not sure if that's worked this out is, all is, the way yet. This is, this is, this is just a... This is, this is an invasion of privacy issue. I'm completely against it. Not, I mean, not that I have anything to hide, but... Uh -huh. uh, this sounds like a terrible idea. Why I think sweating? this would be a great idea. I mean, you could get teachers yeah. and other people who would work with kids. You could put them the priests. in. Priests? If, if this worked for everybody, that would be great. We'd be able to eliminate pedophilia. Yeah, but I mean, like, there's too many variables. I mean, like, like what if the person administering the test is, like, some really hot chick, you know, and you just can't stop thinking about it because you're, you're a, just so hot. You're, in a, yeah. you're an MRI machine. There's nobody in the room with you. Yeah. You're just looking at a screen. But, but, like, I'm remembering the receptionist 
in the hall and she was just so hot that's why it's a false positive they're all mm. I, I'm not really worried that that's going to happen. Yeah. What if you were just remembering really hot heterosexual sex you were having one night and like that's just what... I don't think that would show I, up in the brain scan. I don't think that's the way it works. Yeah, everyone comes in sort of a similar baseline, you know. It's, you, you're throwing fancy science words at me. Listen, this is, this is, I, speak, I speak constitution and okay. this is an invasion of privacy. Uh, uh, right. this, despite Damien's objection, they, they were looking at these, and it's important to know a very interesting fact that I, I would not have called in a million years, but when they were looking at this is, did you know that half of all first-time pedophilic offenders aren't pedophiles? Very interesting. So if you think of what a pedophile is, it is somebody who's attracted to a child, a prepubescent child. That's the definition of right. pedophilia. Half of the people who commit pedophilia aren't actually pedophiles in the sense that they're attracted to them. It's literally that they can't get an adult woman and they have access to a child. Oh, so we're talking about – so this includes the pedophiles where you're a guy in a bar and a 17-year-old no, prostitute. No, no, no. That wouldn't be a pedophile. That would be statutory rape. Pedophile would be below the age of puberty. Those aren't real okay. pedophiles. Like, I, they, they are not commonly referred to in the community – as like real, like like they're posers. Real so like the like the poser community. <laughs> uh -huh. Like like yeah, they're, so they're the not going to get half. They're all posers. Yeah, they're just not going to get into like the really hardcore chat rooms. Well, but like, I, if you ask me, I think not... I think those are the ones that should really be drawn and quartered. Like those are the ones that other pedophiles should get mad at and like try and kill in prison because yeah. they'll be like, listen, I was born this way, or I have this traumatic brain injury. It made me a pedophile. I can't control it. I try desperately to every day. You just were too lazy to head down to the bar and there was a junior high closer to your house. I can't believe half is the number. Half, half of a the first people. Time, a first time pedophilic offenders. Because they can't get someone their own age to just decide, I'm going for the kids. Exactly. That is fucked up. So we're not making prostitution legal and it is hurting our children. That's, That's right. what I'm getting. <laughs> That's right. That is remarkably true. It, it, the way that you say that. We are molesting our children with our votes. Legalize prostitution. Molesting children <laughs> with votes was the worst campaign platform you ever ran on. No wonder Romney lost. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, one of the things the lead researcher wanted to note is that it's important to find out if there are little idiosyncrasies to this, like if an adult's brain would show that response if they were in a position where they didn't have romantic feelings to a child but dealt with them a lot and had a lot of love for them. So if they were a teacher or a mm -hmm. daycare worker, would they have something that would mimic that but didn't mean that they were attracted to kids? Yeah, because that could really muddy the waters. That really could. <laughs> Uh, they, he talked about how it remains uncertain as to why pedophilia actually occurs in human beings. They did say that a lot of them, a substantial amount, have, inc have incurred some kind of traumatic brain injury before the age of 12. So there might be something that you, you jack a kid's head hard enough and you hit the reset button and all of a sudden they'll never stop being attracted to kids. No way, but what about... It's like the world's worst fountain of youth. <laughs> <laughs> the what? only part of your brain that'll never age is the part that tells you what you want to have sex with. <laughs> In the, in the future, like, you know, uh, in the future, a surgeon can just go, oh, I see the problem here. Somebody flipped this thing to pedophile. All yeah. right. Yeah, that's right. I fixed it. You just flip it back. I'm oversimplifying the process. <laughs> it's not a literal switch. <laughs> no, but what about the, what about the sort of long-held belief that if you are molested as a child, you are much more likely to then go on and become a pedophile yourself? Which is true. And, and, and right. that does not account for the majority of pedophiles, though. So the majority of pedophiles have not been <laughs> contrary not to what Law and Order SVU has taught me. The majority of pedophiles have not been molested in their youth. So here's a kind of an interesting way to look at this, and I, I saw a bunch of different lead ups to it. Uh, there are a lot of people who get molested and then they become pedophiles themselves. And if you are molested, you have a much higher percentage chance of becoming a pedophile. But most pedophiles have not been molested. Okay. It's not like being a zombie where it started off with one. And then, you know, it increased exponentially. It's more like being uh -huh. a werewolf. If you're lucky enough to survive the encounter with the pedophile, you may become a pedophile yourself. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I see. You're, you're looking at it through zombie. No, look at yeah. the werewolf mythology. Just, that's where I've gone wrong here. You just have to survive the bites. Okay, so on to question number one. What could we use a pedophile test for? And what would happen when someone eventually becomes the pedophile test minority report? Okay, so you're saying that a machine is telling me is telling somebody as some minor or some police force that I will one day molest or well, that you well, are a pedophile. It's, it's a really skinny bald woman in a pool with a twin sister. That's right. If we're basing this off minority report, I imagine the precogs to be a way more disturbing image. Yeah, like, like, the precogs know. are pretty disturbing anyway, and they're very 
sort of prepubescent looking. Well, they're going to be even younger, and they're going to reenact and relive the molestation that happens in the future each yeah. time. I, again, not precogs. FMRI machine, guys. <laughs> FMRI machine. I, I saw the movie, Bobby. I know yeah, what it's called. Yeah. The Minority Report reference was supposed to say what happens when that thing fucks up and says that you have a child molester when, in fact, that person is – or a pedophile – when that person is not a pedophile. Because somebody's manipulated the MRI machine to uh, the precog, which, uh, the, well, the, yeah, whichever you call them. There's three <laughs> of them. There's three MRI machines, and they all work together. <laughs> somebody manipulated, like if somebody staged a molesting that they later saw, like right. in a manner of a previous molesting. Yeah. yeah. Then yeah, yeah. you can get Who, caught up in that. In fact, that's what I'm going to argue when I get when I pop hot on this machine. Like this is a false. That you're already oh. anticipating that so you're going to test positive for the, the pedophile. Part. Listen, I, I'm just saying, what if? I mean, let's. let's... <laughs> no, you're actually saying when I do. That's they're yeah. very different. Okay, you it, didn't say what if till we asked you. So about I didn't realize it. I was on trial. I didn't realize it That's was a great later. jury. Trial? That'll happen afterwards. It's just you're... We don't need to record everything I'm saying. Like we can edit things out, right? <laughs> it's still recorded. Yeah. But I mean, like we could delete it. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do that. Okay, sweet. <laughs> uh, where where should we use this? What do you guys think? Schools, obviously. I think maybe churches. But what are the things we're not thinking of? Where are the places that um, this, this type of technology would be useful to know if you have a pedophile or not? Politicians. Ooh, politicians. People, people that would power. keep a lot of people out of politics. People in power, I think. Public molestation Public checks or pedophilia yeah, checks. Yeah, it'll be like, you know, you do your piss test for your drugs. Mm -hmm. Then you go into the MRI, just a quick check. Mm -hmm. Porn star. You don't think a porn star should... Possibly be attracted. No, to I want my porn stars to be in the moment. I want them to be attracted okay. to. I don't want their primary. Well, I don't want them point. to be imagining the person they're fucking minus twelve years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or six years. I don't. <laughs> I actually think that they should do it, especially for for groups of people. You know, like little people, like dwarves and whatnot. Uh, anybody who oh. works around them, because you wouldn't want you know f misplaced fire. You know, accidentally hitting the wrong team. Yeah. High school boys, if they're not allowed to think of. Girls of minors. Uh -huh. Imagine that. Like imagine like. Okay. Like, so you're using it as a way to control them from thinking about having sex with anybody. And focus that. Yeah, we're gonna. We're gonna, all these guys are gonna pop hot because they all want to fuck girls under eighteen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, that's good. And, again, not really pedophilia. It has to be prepubescent. So don't think it'll work. Yeah, he got me on that one too. We're gonna see which way the law is written up. <laughs> okay. Question number two. What could they show you on that screen that would light up your attraction regions of the brain? In the same way, pictures of kids light up the pedophile regions. Um, heterosexual, just just hot, hot women. Just, just women. Just because you're just, just a straight old so heterosexual man. You were about to man. say men, but said women. Well, I mean, like, like I mean, like women, and then like maybe a man giving it like to her. And I'd like him to be big. I don't want him to not bring a gift to the party. Yeah, S certainly not. All right, so yeah, I mean, he's gonna be, and maybe there's like two or three more guys in there too, yeah. because like it's a romantic thing. This is her fantasy. Yeah, it's about her. Okay, but that's what I'm thinking about. Just, just hot. Now, are those guys do any women. do any with anything men. with each other? Those those three dudes who are in the same room. Well, I mean, you have to practice kissing. Like, you can't. You need something. You don't want to kiss cold. She, her mouth is taken. Let me just say. Okay. Oh. At some point, right? You're, you're. She's not gonna have. She has a lot of things, places to put her mouth, and you gotta. You can't get cold. It's like. Tom Brady wears a jacket. It's funny. Tom Brady was what I was going to say to get me fired up. <laughs> you would just watch pictures of Tom Brady. That would light your attraction. Yeah, except up when he had that other. long, dumbass hair. Thanks a lot, Giselle. I was trying to think that. I'm like, what would really set me off, you know, uh, when I'm in that machine? And then what would set me off that it, like, would weird out the guy? Yeah. You know, and I was, I was thinking about, it, like, I bet you I could feel fairly sexually attracted to, like, a really nice looking 68 Camaro. Like I feel like I would I would have that vision and the guy would go like, eh, it's kind of like a little bit odd and it cost you that job at the body shop though. Yeah. <laughs> I really like that the Germans have revolution. I don't know if you guys knew this, but they had an old test for detecting a pedophile. Oh yeah. Essentially they just deputize a 13 year old and they'd have a bunch of suspects that they suspected and they would just march this, this young detective uh -huh. up and down, parade them up and down naked and whoever grabbed his balls well i mean they had a bell attached to each man's penis so the one that rings oh that's stirred. tricky I, it's an old world technique that like you yeah. know <laughs> not all tests have to be high tech that's a good point sometimes you just tie a bell to a cock and see what happens <laughs> on to question number three 
I was reading the report, and, they, and they, when they were talking about the control group of heterosexuals, they said they looked at this and it lit up their brain regions when they were looking at, quote-unquote, adults. But it didn't say adults of the opposite sex, or in the case of homosexuals, adults of the same sex. It just said adults. They were sexually attracted to adults. And I think that's because, as we all know, sexuality is kind of a scale, and you fall mm -hmm. somewhere on that scale. How nervous were any of the participants who happened to be both homophobic and harbor homoerotic thoughts, which I think are most homophobics. How nervous were they when they happened to make eye contact with the researchers monitoring their sexual desires in real time? I mean, we should make this a challenge. Anytime somebody starts <laughs> talking about how gay marriage is going to ruin the... Fine. Okay. You honestly believe gay marriage is going to ruin the country? Great. Here's the test. I'm going to put you in an fMRI machine. I'm going to show you a picture of a dude, and I'm pretty sure you're gay. Because we can tell in the same way you can tell for the pedophiles. I'm pretty sure you're kind of gay. Who's yeah. the dude? Like Robert Downey Jr. That's like that's a freebie. That's mm -hmm. that's like every yeah. straight dude has the Robert Downey Jr. Jr. freebie. True, Are and I want to put in what those like homophobic dudes. I want to put them in the fMRI machine and prove that to them and be like, look, you're way gayer than all these people you're angry about. Who's the dude you'd show? Like, oh, a, the or guy. What type? Okay, I think well, they showed 250 pictures in this particular one, so I think you'd show a series of men, and you could also pinpoint their type. They're like, not only are you gay, but you love bears. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I got gotcha. you. So, like, you, like there'd be, of course, very attractive men that nobody would blame. And maybe you'd start off like, oh, like, is that your tiptoe into, yeah. into Bear? It's yeah. Like, I mean, who wouldn't fuck him? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, Ryan Reynolds? Yeah. It's, right. If your brain is not lighting up in the attracted part to him, then it's not that you're gay or straight. You're just not human. <laughs> Check his pulse. He might be dead. Yeah. Second Ryan Reynolds attraction reference Bobby has made in two weeks. Well, if he stopped being so fucking hot, maybe <laughs> I wouldn't have to keep talking about it. I'm surprised Ryan Reynolds wasn't the thing that you would think of to make your... Actually, MRI pop. Well, I yeah. just thought that was default. In the 68 Camaro, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> With that kid. Uh, okay, on <laughs> to story number two, Capsaicin Me Crazy. <laughs> so Capsaicin, as you might know, is the, the stuff that's hot in chili peppers and whatnot. Ay, 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 ay. A new study looked at mice bred without a specific pain receptor. This is the TRPV1. And this specific pain receptor, when they were bred without it, actually led to mice living longer. Somehow not having this pain receptor let them live up to 14% longer, which is fairly substantial. What's more is that exposure to a molecule found in chili peppers in capsaicin may confer some of the same benefits as losing that pain receptor, meaning that just eating a bunch of chili peppers could give you this benefit too. What they think happens is the capsaicin actually bonds to the neuron that's triggered by this and basically takes it out. And so if you eat enough capsaicin you might be able to get some of the same benefits of longer life as these people who are born without this particular, or, or with a defective gene for the TRPV1. When they take it out, is it just something spicy, like Mexican, Indian, Thai? When they take it out to eat. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's, that's exactly how they do it. They, yeah, take yeah. it out, they take it out to eat someplace there. Not they, something bland. I'd... They think this is true because <laughs> the TRPV1 not only is a pain receptor, but also deals with how you regulate insulin in your body. And that rins insulin regulation is what can go later on in life in things like diabetes and just older patients. So taking this thing out might indeed affect our long lifespan. Or in the meantime, before we get our gene therapy down, maybe eating a bunch of jalapenos? You know, it's, it's sort of like a long-held belief in women's magazines that eating spicy food helps your digestion and overall health. But they never really give you know, these magazines, they never really give great scientific evidence for it, but it's very much in this realm of, well, maybe if it's actually regulating something going on in the pancreas or your yep. insulin production, like it might actually be true, cosmopolitan. Studies like this tend to be jalapeno business. <laughs> so that the, they are, Damien. The, TRP, <laughs> the TRPV1 is already a popular target for uh, drug companies trying to treat pain. They're already going after this. And a therapy that, that blocks this is now in development for migraines. But this could go well beyond pain control, as we just saw, because it has to do with your insulin. Uh, this could also be treatment for diabetes and obesity. So very interesting news. It has to do with a very simple thing like capsaicin, and it might end up being a way that we can live longer in the future. In fact, in the end, the mice without the TRPV1 were protected from some of this, the same stuff that would affect an old age mouse. So not only did they live longer, they didn't have some of the same diseases, including declines in metabolism, cognition, and physical activity. Question number one, if spicy foods make you live longer, 
then how come the cultures with the spiciest foods all have average lifespans under 60 years? <laughs> I'm going to say it's because in order to get rid of that spice, you have to have dairy. So you have to eat a lot of cheese and, you know, horchata and all kinds of good shit. Okay. Um, so you sort of you sort of combat the good effects with the bad. The spiciness is counteracted by lactose. Yeah. <laughs> well, by fat, actually. Uh, Mexico. Uh-huh. When you deep fry anything, it's not healthy for you. Okay. Mm-hmm. Chili pepper or not. India, come on. That place place looks like... The, they still have the plague. Good luck getting clean water. Yeah. Right. And Thailand, their numbers are thrown off because of how many young boys die each year from working the sex trade. Because they don't have scanners to a, at the airport to detect pedophiles. Yeah, if they could get... The, <laughs> Thailand is a place that needs the and pedophile they eat scanner, spicy right? Food. Yes, the, uh, we could have gone back. It would have been a better answer. If you could, <laughs> if you put the pedophile detector at the Thai airport, then all of a sudden the Thai boys eating the spicy food will live so much longer that Thailand's average life expectancy will shoot up into the mid-90s. Building bridges. Well, I don't know. Do peppers get rid of AIDS? Yeah. <laughs> Burn them right out. <laughs> Question number two. That might be on corrections in a future episode. <laughs> <laughs> Question number two. If it turns out that capsaicin really can affect people's health and lifespan... It would turn people like myself, who cannot take anything spicier than a warm glass of milk, into persecuted minorities. What are you going to do to make sure I'm not negatively affected by a health advance for society as a whole that I personally cannot participate in? Not a fucking thing. See you later, pussy. Yeah. How is, dare you? This is an <laughs> extinction event for you. This yeah. is racist, by the way, because I think that part of my sen- sensitivity to temperature and hot things is that I'm the whitest guy on earth. This is a racist discovery, and I think it should be put away. Have you thought that maybe, you know, just as a boxer can get used to being punched in the face? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You could get used to eating spice. It's not like you have an allergic. Your throat doesn't close. You no, just no, find it unpleasant. No matter how many times I rub icy hot in my groin area, it never gets good. I'm always in pain. But the that trick goes is to icy ejaculate. first. That's why. <laughs> it's your problem. He keeps taking the icy hot challenge. His job is to ejaculate before his balls catch on fire. But I thought the ice was to cool the pain, and then the hot was to relax it away. <laughs> Okay, on to the next question. Question number three. As life extension tactics like this become more and more of a real possibility, how will we deal with the overpopulation issue that will be compounded by the elderly not dying off? If we have a bunch of old people running around, the overpopulation is going to get way worse. No, I don't want that. I think we've talked about it before. I, I am not a fan of the elderly. I don't need them to be stuck around any longer. Logan's run? Have you thought of uh, maybe that elderly people who eat, you know, more adventurous food might live more dangerous lifestyles and that this problem might correct itself? Okay. <laughs> Just reckless hot wings and yeah, the spicy jumping might, off buildings. Miami spicy, Beach. <laughs> yeah, the spicy foods are going to make them all want to do base jumping. Totally. It's extreme. Well, that and Mountain Dew. Those are the two things that make you want to do base jumping. <laughs> So we have to find some way to kill off the elderly to make sure that these life extension techniques don't overpopulate the earth. But we want to keep the good elderly, right? We want the ones that we want to live and we want to survive. I mean, the elderly as a population don't generally like spicy things. That's true. You know, usually they're like, hold it on the side. Which is weird because you start losing more taste buds as you get older. So you would think that you might need a little more kick, a little more... I mean, is, but it causes the indigestion. What doesn't at that age? Trust me, <laughs> sweetie. Just live. You're only on this earth for so long. Oi, oi, vey. Maybe they could combine this with that research we learned about a few weeks back, in which STDs were rampant in senior communities because oh, they're right. boning a whole bunch. Maybe we could open up a senior nightclub that's basically just a public sex club slash spicy Mexican food joint. Totally. Live they- long and fuck doing it. <laughs> That'll be the name. That'll be the name. Short and to the point. I love your club. <laughs> yeah. I just picture all of these old guys getting blowjobs from these old women and just like oh, yeah. their penis on fire. You can walk into this club and publicly watch a combined 160 years of sex act right in front of you. Oh. Maybe that's God. something we do to curb the population because if all the people are living oh, longer, yeah, yeah. we can we abstinence t- program. Even better, we could team young. <laughs> totally. Fertile people up with the elderly who are no longer fertile, so that the couples don't, the, their union don't bring a child into the earth and therefore help the overpopulation. You oh. could have slept with Wilford Brimley. Yeah, still could can, I? still can. Could I? Yeah, he is still alive. He has diabetes. I so thought I'd he get had on. diabetes. <laughs> All the more urgent. This, this window is closing. Maybe you should have had more capsaicin. Don't regret this, like John Candy. <laughs> Also, you should just do it every once in a while. You got to give the affirmative action fucks. You guys know that, right? Like, if you have been on a long run of just having sex with white chicks, you got to throw an Asian in there 
Otherwise, you're racist. That's the way I'm thinking of it. You should definitely do an affirmative okay. action fuck for old white guy with diabetes, mm-hmm. right? Because most of the diabetes, not in the white community. So he's a minority that Fair you're enough. completely overlooking in your sexual escapades. You mean the sugars. The sugars. <laughs> I'm sorry. I kind of stopped listening to your story when it got really racist. You see, I don't even oh. see color when I look at people or gender or age. No. Just children's <laughs> cute faces blowing up your attractive part of your brain. What about diabetes? Dude, I, I said hot women, man, yeah. bro. Totally yeah. not dudes. Hot women with four hot dudes. dudes making out. What kind of driver's license photo is that, by the way? The kind I, that means you never get a ticket? <laughs> One that they made me retake at the DMV three times. <laughs> On to article number three. Back that class up. Uh, this is a very interesting one. This has more of popularization of science and that kind of thing. A young high school student, Paris Gray, young African-American woman in Atlanta. Paris, by the way. Can we talk about Paris and how that's a popular name now? Paris Gray. She put a message it's in a her Paris yearbook, Hilton. and the message was, quote, unquote, when the going gets tough, just remember to barium, carbon, potassium, thorium, astonine, arsenic, sulfur, uranium, phosphorus. Which, if you take the symbols from the periodic table of the elements and spell that out, it means when the going get, gets tough, just remember to back that ass up. <laughs> oh, she yeah. reads Nietzsche. That's right. <laughs> uh, which is, of course, a uh, juvenile song from the late 90s. Awesome, awesome reference. She was an honor student, obviously, because she came up with the idea. Right, of because she anyway. knew about the periodic table. That's right. It's clever. Uh, yeah. Her school has gotten Super offended. Clever. Not only are they mad at her and they've sanctioned her and they haven't let her do her senior walk, which I guess is an activity they do, they're threatening to not let her go through graduation. Oh, and this is such BS to me. It is so stupid. Such BS to me. You're just pissed because you didn't think of it. Because exactly it's right. so clever and witty and smart that you probably didn't even get it when somebody brought it to your attention, assistant principal. I do like they, they were talking to the mom. And they're like, what did you think when you first heard that? And I think they were looking for like, I was really disappointed. And yeah. all she said was, she's such a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Her mom was a cheerleader in high school. Yeah. Just, they've never really meshed. Don't they have bullying to worry about? Isn't that the, isn't that the, the issue in schools right now? They, like, have, they right. certainly have more than this. What's funny is something similar happened last year when an Asian-American student did something similar under her yearbook quote. She didn't even have like the, the lead up to it. Her name was Jessica Lee, and her yearbook message was fluorine, uranium, carbon, potassium, bismuth, technetium, helium, sulfur, germanium, thelium, oxygen, neon, yttrium. In other words, fuck bitches, get money. <laughs> what kind of Asian Which is, is this? of course, a biggie line. <laughs> and she didn't get in any trouble at all. That's what I love. Like, of course is, not. The, 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 nobody got mad at this. Everybody said, how clever and, and cute. This is really neat. She gets to move on. However, the black chick who makes a much less offensive rap reference all of a sudden can't graduate. Different. Night and day. Completely different. All right. First of all, stop calling him that. That's offensive. <laughs> Both promote promiscuity. Agreed. Uh-huh. Okay, but the other one promotes entrepreneurship as well. Oh, that's why. Getting oh, paid. I see. I, I hear back that ass up. I hear teenage pregnancy, and we can't encourage that. I just think twerk. Just a harmless little twerk. Question Never num- heard anybody. A couple of questions <laughs> for my panel. And question number one, shouldn't there be a rule that any joke that requires one to reference the periodic table of the elements is automatically not allowed to get you in trouble? Is this what we're really worried about with our youth? Yeah, I hundred yeah, percent. I'm I'm terrified. <laughs> yeah, I, th- these periodic table of the element jokes are what's going to bring society down. Listen, as somebody who who took George Zimmerman's side, I'm not a racist. I'm not a. Ra- I just I just think you it's s- it's completely different. You just want to stand your ground against young exactly. teenage black girls. I'm standing my ground from her graduating high school. <laughs> I think they're just pissed because they're like, yttrium. Is that real? Yttrium? Will you look yttrium? Google yttrium. Holy shit, she's right. (laughs) I just think it's, I think anytime a kid is making a joke that's too smart for most of their teachers to get, and you have to pull out a a fucking reference book to to be able to get the joke, you should applaud that kid and pat them on the back. Yeah. That kid's going to be your fucking boss one day. Yeah. She's a nerd with a sense of humor. Like, that's that's rare. Yeah. Go her. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We are a dying breed. That's right. We're behind you, sweetheart. (laughs) Mainly because she's going to back that ass up. We're going to be behind her. <laughs> Question number two. Clearly, society is not offended by the joke itself, as the Asian girl's quote was arguably much more offensive, but no one seemed to care. Are they actually angry at the vulgarity of the saying, back that ass up? Or are they just terrified of a young black woman showing an interest in STEM classes? I'll tell you what happened. They're Biggie fans. It's a, it's a juvenile reference instead of Biggie. So they let the Asian chick go, but not her. Right. 
I feel like she's a gettable celebrity for this show. Okay. We should, it doesn't all have to be interdimensional. Okay, we should contact oh, her and like see if she... she'll be on the show. Oh, yeah. that'd be great. I mean, really, maybe I'll actually get to sit in for this interview for once. Yeah. yeah. By the way, legally, it does have to be interdimensional, so it doesn't seem like we're slandering somebody. So No, I, I actually think le- legitimately she'd like to talk about this. We could bullshit with her. She yeah. thinks she's. She clearly thinks she's funny. Maybe let her sling some jokes. Oh, what I, I super <laughs> hope that she has like most of our our conversation done in periodic table. Oh, that would be elements. great. And if she's really good, maybe we could replace the female voice on the show. That's with... right. Oh, that's that's a great idea. Don't worry, Damien. We're not replacing your voice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Question sort of... number three. I think we should use this as a test for who our nation's future science educators should be. We should hand the new chemistry teacher this quote as she wrote it. And see if he gets it. And if he chuckles, he's both smart and laid back enough to be effective, and he gets the job. What other unconventional teaching tests would you like to utilize to find the best science ed- educators? Don't let Damien answer because of the whole MRI thing. Oh, that's right. I was actually going to suggest the older German test for that. <laughs> Except it's a deputized student. I, I believe that's, that's the one where the 13-year-old walks back and forth. I think uh, the the German translation of that is erection walk. We should probably be, you know, every once in a while they make a huge deal about some female teacher, you know, sexually abusing her male student. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which he's psyched on. If he got good grades, that's a pass. Yeah. Like if he got, a, it doesn't have to be oh, in all classes, so? but at least her class and it was earned. You could uh-huh. show that it wasn't a given grade. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can see that. What are you going to do to teachers as they come in to test whether or not they're going to be good science educators other than having them read this yearbook quote and seeing if they laugh? I think that they should have to go through a lightning round from our show. Oh, yeah. Those lightning rounds are real dangerous. It's one of the reasons we don't do them a lot anymore. (laughs) No, no, don't do it. If we don't, even if we were going to do it, I have the sound effects. You don't have to do that, but we're not doing that right now. You can do it when we do it to the teachers. Well, think of it like, like my lightning is the intro for the lightning. No. Yeah, well, For, that's how you know it's coming. And a lightning round can... You can never know it's coming. That's the point. Oh. Right, right. A lightning <laughs> round. Stop. No. I thought one was coming. You can't... Yeah, we were talking about it a lot. <sighs> Man, I hope there's a lightning round. <laughs> yeah. No, it doesn't... <laughs> Let's move on to the things we thought we knew. The things we thought we knew. Because sometimes old science, like old people, is worthless and wrong. First, and things we thought we knew, a very interesting story about the kiwi. You guys know about kiwis? The fruit? The bird? The bird, indeed. I was talking about Damien. Oh, yeah. The fruit. (laughs) Damien does get called kiwi occasionally. Yeah. Sleep with one New Zealand dude, and (laughs) all of a sudden... It's also because he's filled with green innards. He only shits the color green. Also, Uh, I lay the largest egg in proportion to my body size. That's right. (laughs) So a kiwi is a mid-sized flightless bird that lives in New Zealand and kind of looks like some other birds, like the emu that lives on the Australian mainland nearby. Do you think it's really embarrassing to be a flightless bird? I do. I think in in other bird circles. Do you think all the other birds are like... "Mm." Not if you can kick another bird to death. Yeah, but they can yeah, just fly away and laugh. Fly, yeah. That's fine. If you can kick a lion to death or kick some, uh, kick a human to death. I think they get made fun of a lot more. Yeah, I honestly they still do. can't fly. At least the, the emu and the ostrich. I mean, yeah. Not, and the kiwi. The kiwi's not killing anybody. The no. kiwi's no. getting picked on. Or the penguin, yeah. But they can get away from great white sharks sometimes. I think penguin's a midpoint because they're kind of flying through the water. They've got a, they've got a cool motion to go with. Yeah. The other dumb running birds, no, forget them. <laughs> so we thought for a long time maybe it's related to the emu, which is a, another big flightless bird on the nearby island of Australia. You know, maybe it's related to a couple of these other flightless birds, but we just got the genetics back, guys, and we found out it's related to the elephant bird. That doesn't even sound like a real thing. Is that just, was that just a really ugly bird that was ostracized? Yeah. 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 No, he was a, a strongly Republican bird. <laughs> the elephant bird was a 10-foot-tall, 550-pound flightless bird that lived on the island of Madagascar up to 1,000 years ago when it was finally made extinct, probably by humans. Wow. Huge, giant bird. It's related to this kind of small kiwi, and ironically, both are flightless. So their common ancestor was a flighted bird, and it looks now like, from the genetic evidence, we think it was a, about a chicken-sized bird that could fly, that lived around Southeast Asia and all those islands at the time, 
was moving around during its moves, would occasionally settle on an island. As evolution happens, they would lose the ability to fly, become flightless birds, and then that would happen in different places periodically. Well, the last time that those two animals shared a common relative back 60 million years ago, it was, was flying the around. Dodo. Not the dodo. <laughs> It was flying Aww, around. I wanted it to be the dodo, too. Some grew up on New Zealand, some in Madagascar, and the differences became one small flightless bird and one 10-foot-tall, 550-pound <laughs> flightless bird, and the ones in between, like the emus, ostriches, and stuff, different lineage, not related. One small step for a small flightless bird, one giant step for a giant flightless bird. Maybe in Australia, just emus or dicks. You know, like they're like the bullies. They didn't allow them. You know, they just always made them feel bad, kept them small. Kicked them while they were down, perhaps? Yeah. Meanwhile, in Madagascar, they were free to This to was thrive. a culture thing. This was basically the culture that they grew up in. That, that's what, what changed it. Yeah. Well, and then, ironically enough, the big brother who was doing so well, who had the you know $200,000 a year job, he's the one who ended up dying off a thousand years ago, and the little kiwi made it through. In your face. Sometimes the brightest star... Uh shines half as long <laughs> i like this story about figuring out where the kiwi came from uh one of the other things i thought was really interesting as a side parallel is the human occupation so these birds made it to new zealand which we know is a big island off the continent of australia and madagascar which is a big island off the continent of africa they made it to these far away places these are very far away from each other and they you know co-evolved to be flightless birds at the same time what's also interesting what paralleled that 50 million years later, 60 million years later, was the occupation of those islands by human beings, most notably the Polynesians. The Polynesians are the ones who occupied New Zealand, even though mm -hmm. there was a whole bunch of Aborigines right there on the mainland Australia that didn't occupy it. And the Polynesians sailed all the way from fucking Borneo, Southeast Asia, to Madagascar, <laughs> off the south coast of Africa, and populated it. And the Bantu people who were living on the mainland didn't come till after they got there. So Polynesians managed to settle two giant islands right next to huge continents before the people on those fucking continents made it on there. <laughs> they all look like the Easter Island heads. So uh, right. these Kiwis predecessed the human ancestors that then flew in and uh, took those spots away from them. I feel like the, the birds got there and they were like, like expatriates who travel, you know, and they're just like, you know what? I don't want to go back. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to give up my wings. I'm just going to have pina coladas and just get tan. Were they domesticated by the Maori, and did they live like just a really cushy life? Totally. Totally it was cushy. By the way, if you guys are ever looking at a map of like the Indian Ocean, just check this out because it'll be really trippy when you look at it. Look at the distance between Borneo and Madagascar, and then look at the distance between Madagascar and mainland Africa. And it would, it, for those of you who live in Southern California, it would be like if the Japanese were the ones who settled Catalina Island. <laughs> it's it, they it, the fact that the Africans didn't make it there and that the Aboriginal Australians didn't make it to New Zealand, but the fucking Polynesians conquered the globe and uh, for, through the Pacific and Indian Ocean and made it there is just amazing. Well, it's even more impressive when you consider how large Maoris and Samoan people are. Like yeah. those boats had to have been beefy oh, yeah. boats. Beefy boats. They had to send like one boat per person back yeah. and forth. And like Junior Seau had to man all of them. That's right. All right, let's uh, head on to the next topic, which I think will be a lightning round. Yes. No, I have, I have the actual sound effect, Damien. I can do it on my own. No joke. I was about to do the lightning anyway. I guessed it. Okay. I, okay. Yeah. I'm batting 50. Okay. <laughs> lightning round. All right. <laughs> God damn it. So in the lightning round, I will ask my, my panelists, one question, one to two sentences, and they will give me a one to two sentence response about a recent scientific discovery. Question number one. We've known for a long time that social pressure strongly influences belief. But what did a recent study out of China find about the social pressure influencing belief? Lightning round, go. They found recently that it's the social pressure of having a small penis that causes the Chinese to believe they're going to take over the world one day. Oh, small penis. Damien. What's going on? Social pressure to have a son to pass along your inheritance to and culture to will lead to the belief that fathers should kill their daughters or put them up for adoption. That's not really a joke. That's just more what happens over there. I see. I see. <laughs> uh, no, actually, what they found was that social pressure strongly influences belief, but that influence fades after approximately three days. So you only have to wait three days before you can get rid of that social pressure. Lightning round question number two. In a new study published in Nature out of NYU Langone Medical Center, what activity were mice who were specifically engineered to have autism 
performing on a regular, almost obsessive basis. Masturbating. Oh, constant jacking with the mice. Punching their parents in the face. Can mice punch, Jackie? I don't feel um, like they can punch. I think like scratch. They they're scratchers. There's not a lot of forearm strength. Yeah, you know, it's all sort of which is also a, a problem when they're masturbating, like you mentioned before. Yeah, whatever the mouse equivalent is, whatever whatever <laughs> Jenny McCarthy's son would do to Jenny McCarthy if he was a mouse and she was also a mouse. So what he would do is he would go up to the other mouse in the cage and pick off his whiskers and eat them in front of him. Oh, which is sick in its own right. Well, that's what she gets for getting vaccinated when she wasn't looking. <laughs> The actual answer, the mice are giving other mice mohawks. Oh. So it turns out if you we give... We call this barbering. Yeah, it turns out if you give a, a specifically engineer a mouse to have autism, he's very likely to obsessively groom his cage mates and give them mohawks. Yeah, barbering is actually pretty... It's a pretty common behavior. So metrosexuality is what's causing autism. That's right. <sighs> we figured it out done. on this show. Done this and was, done. This was the day that autism was cured, everybody. Uh, They'll write stories. <laughs> Go back in time to prevent Queer Eye for the straight guy from being put on TV. Listen. <laughs> All right, question number three. What is being found in late Pleistocene soils that may be a problem as it is uncovered? The totally not gay box of porn I have buried 100 feet in my backyard. And right. anything that's gay in there, somebody else must have dug up and put up there because that's... Well, it couldn't be from you because it's 13,000 years old, the late Pleistocene, so... That you weren't around back then. That had to be somebody else's gay porn. Yeah, exactly. It's been passed down. Yeah, I've, I've inherited this. It, it starts out with a lot of dinosaur gay porn. <laughs> That's right. Small amber droplets with fossilized mosquitoes that have dino DNA that we can now make a dino theme park. Okay, late Pleistocene was long after the dinosaurs were dead. Uh, we're still only looking about 13,000 years ago. But what was found is sequestered carbon, a bunch of high carbon soils, likely from big fires that came through after the glaciers. Sequestered, so like it was improperly funded. Yeah, sequ <laughs> no, sequestered uh, means that it's all caught up, and we're afraid that as they get exposed to the open air, that, that carbon will be released, only increasing the greenhouse effect from carbon gases. In the mosquito, though. Yes, of course. Right, in okay. the amber of the mosquito with okay. the dinosaur blood. I got gotcha. you. Okay. There's be a lot of mosquitoes. <laughs> And because this particular lightning round <laughs> <laughs> No? No, don't need any of it. Because this is what the autistic mice would have wanted, I'm gonna give this round to Damien. So Damien, you win the lightning oh. round. <laughs> <laughs> that was real lightning that time. You you can't see it yeah. because you know we're on the radio, it but it's it, real lightning. It's really hard to time this because there has, I have to have a flash of light on my phone yeah. and I have to wait an appropriate amount of time to yeah. then give it. So there's a lot of skill that goes into these lightning strikes. It's really exciting when it happens, though. Okay, let's move on to corrections. And now it's time for corrections, where we address Jackie's mistakes. All right, so we have a, a couple corrections to do. I think the only one we might have time for is to get the big glaring one out of the way, though. <sighs> Damien, how do you feel when Jackie messes up really badly? Because for me, I kind of feel like, man, you should just die. Like, you should just not oh, be alive saying. anymore. Die? What is this, China? Yeah. I told well, you if it was, we wouldn't have you here as a problem, <laughs> right? Or statistically? I told you so, is what uh -huh. you, you said it would work out. Yeah. We've had, we're at 21 episodes. You're right. We, the trial period's over. Way over. <laughs> like, like, we need to have this talk. What? All right. Jackie, would you like to uh, – listen, I don't want to discuss people too much, but let's just talk a little bit briefly about what she did. Last week she was talking <laughs> yeah, please. about the uh, death rates in the United States for basically mothers giving birth and how they're higher than you'd expect. And when she was saying how high they were, she was saying per 100,000 women, you know, it was whatever it was. I think it was in our case 20. But instead of saying 20 women, she said 20%, mm -hmm. which of course – 100,000 women, if every 100,000 women giving birth in the U.S., 20% died. If one-fifth of all pregnant women died giving birth, we'd have a much better society. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I apologize for my uh, misuse of the word percent. I would also like to apologize to all the women out there for Bobby's horrific chauvinism in that comment. How, so those are the all, two corrections. That's it. That's the end of the segment. Thank love you. It, love and respect you, women. Perhaps you should apologize to Marie Stopes, who you just couldn't help I don't know right. that bitch a thing. You kind of proved her right. You could have been accurate and proven her wrong. It would have been a feather in your cap. I'm just saying. You weren't point even Marie. here. I don't. I listened to the episode. I had a week. Whatever. I I have no problem correcting my own mistakes. 
I made no mistake in the way I talked to Marie Stopes. Oh, really? Maybe. Sounds like you're having some problems correcting your mistakes. Sounds like you're having some problems admitting <laughs> them, yeah. for one. Maybe we can get Marie No, I made the, the percent mistake, glaring, as you pointed out. I'm embarrassed. Should be. But I'm embarrassed. Should be. But if you're willing I'm to glad a- we're bringing it up on the air for well, such a long time. That's been a lovely couple of minutes. If you're willing to apologize, I'm sure next episode we can get Miss Stopes back on to, and she, and she could You'd teach like you. that, wouldn't you? She would love to educate you. You would like that. She could make like a tutor, like kind of like think of it like that. Uh huh. Yeah, I'll think of it. No shame in asking for help. <laughs> All right, let's move on to our final segment Finish My Story. Finish My Story, where one of us has to complete the other's balls. And here we are with Finish My Story, in which our research scientist, Jackie, will give us the first half of a modern scientific story, and myself and Damien will compete to see if we can't figure out what the story is about. What's the score? The score is four to three. Okay. Bobby. All right, four three. I, it looks like this. we might tie up. Who knows? Maybe I'll pull away. We could still use some fans. That changes today. That changes today. <laughs> um, That's I'm- played out. I'm going to try real hard to get this whole story correct, everyone, so we don't have to have another enjoyable correction segment. Miss Dopes will be here to talk to you about it next week. <laughs> so uh, this is a study out of Zurich where I studied the role of uh, your gut in fear. So I want, you guys, I want you guys to close your eyes. Okay. I want you to picture yourselves as a woman, Damien. You All might not have to go so far. I, I suddenly don't know where I am in reference to any major landmarks. Mm. Okay. I suddenly feel like taking out my emotions on my significant other, despite their doing nothing. I suddenly wish I hadn't done it this way. I suddenly can't navigate giving cardinal directions anymore. I... When I don't know something like a movie <laughs> reference, I just say, how was I supposed to know that? Even though I'm not really that much less strong than you, I feel like I'm going to refuse to help you move. I don't want a career in science, yet I'm mad that there aren't more women in science. Okay, first of all... None of that was the finish my story. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a man now. I'm sorry. What I flashed out. What I blacked out. I, we were trying to get do what you told us. We were getting into character. Yeah, I, yeah. That was that was poor judgment on my part. <laughs> I'm also feeling like you're a huge bitch right now. And I can't believe you wore those shoes. I fucking hate you guys right now. You know what? No points. No points. I'm not even gonna do it. High five. <laughs> Sons of bitches. We love and respect women. We love yeah, it. right. Okay, so wait, you were talking yeah, right. about, you said gut, right? Gut feeling. Okay, all right. Let me just get to the question part. They think they've proven that a gut instinct actually does have an effect on our perspe- perception of a threat. How do they prove that a gut instinct, which is a colloquial term, is a real thing? Okay. Or do you think it's a real thing? What did they call a gut instinct? Like, what was their definition, their measure of it? How did they decide this is a gut instinct as opposed to a feeling? They called it a gut instinct. Okay. Well, like I can, I can't speak. I can speak to how it affects me. Whenever I get a gut instinct, it's usually because I know that some dude's thinking gay thoughts about me mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. everything. And I know with like if he's a big guy, but like a bear, you're supposed to play dead. So I just kiss him before he can kiss me. I think that's more of a groin instinct. Yeah, and like and like I have to get hard by thinking of like hot chicks all the time. Uh huh. And that's just how I get through this experience when I get this gut feeling. And are you afraid? Fear is part of the the experience, part of the eroticism. Yeah, I'm I'm afraid. I feel guilty that I was. So, Damien, what you're saying is it's not so much a feeling in your gut as another man's penis in your gut. That's what's really getting you. It's more in your colon. I mean, yeah. gut. Well, it depends I mean, how hungry he was. Like it's it could it could hit my it could graze my prostate or it could yeah. be a, a train going on to the next stop. <laughs> right. Right, I've always Bobby. felt that gut feelings. I mean, it's pretty obvious where gut feelings have to come from. Mm-hmm. Psychic food. Like, if you've eaten psychic food, oh. you're getting the gut feeling down there because you're digesting it. That's where your gut is working, right? It's pulling all the nutrients okay. slash psychic energy out of that food. I can't wait to see your show on CBS this fall. <laughs> That's, psychic food. That is also why your poo can tell your future. You just okay. have to eat it, though. As scientific as both of those answers are, I wanted to talk to you guys about the gut feeling because I think that when we think of fear, we perceive it as all in our mind. In fact, that's something most people tell People when they're watching a movie that's scary or when you're walking around alone at night and you're scared, it's all in your mind. But it's not just the brain that's sending signals to the stomach that gives you that gut feeling of something is wrong, but it's actually also the reverse. The stomach sending some response back back to the brain. Yeah. And there's a dialogue between the stomach and the nerve and they're conveyed via the vagus nerve. Yep. So in this case, what happens in Vegas doesn't actually stay in Vegas. 
Nice. <laughs> the vagus nerve delivers signals from the brain to the internal organs through the efferent nerves, whereas the organs then send it back through afferent nerves. So scientists cut the afferent nerves of rats, mm -hmm. which made a two-way street into a one-way street, mm -hmm. to see if this had any effect on their perception of fear. Without this gut feeling, are they as afraid? So in behavioral studies where it was surprise fear by turning on bright lights or... I love surprise fear, by the way. That's... <laughs> Well, there, well, there's a different, there's a condition of fear in there's here. There's a lot so. of surprise fear in my scenario. Where... Yeah. Or innate fear is what they called it. So dropping them in an open space or throwing on these bright lights, they weren't nearly as scared as the control rats that had the afferent nerves intact. So this gut instinct yep. plays a role in you getting there's more scared. There's some kind of feedback loop that's enhancing your fear. Right. The condition studies or condition fear where rats learned to equate a sound with an unpleasant experience in that case, there was no difference. Mm. So it's only with the innate fear response that your stomach or internal organs actually play a role and tell back to your brain that something's wrong and that you should be afraid. Very so. interesting. There's some interesting stuff about the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve goes all the way down your body, and they now say, I just read this, this was really interesting, one of the cures for hiccups, which is actually your vagus nerve misfiring, mm -hmm. one of the cures for it is to tickle your anus. And apparently your <laughs> anus which is in that vagus nerve feedback loop, tickling it can help reset the thing that's making you hiccup. So, Do you also have to drink water upside down while you do it? No, no. Just, just digit on the anus. That's all you need. If you bear down hard enough and you have low enough uh, blood pressure, I believe you can make yourself pass out. This was the... Uh, this was if you finger yourself hard enough? How, there are many ways to get to... The many roads lead to rum. Yeah. <laughs> No, I think it was, he was saying bear down like you're trying to push a poo out. But I'm talking like a big defensive stop. You know, okay. it's a Super Bowl <laughs> bear, bear down. down defense. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Very interesting stuff. The, the vagus nerve is one of those interesting feedback loops that, is, that has some counterintuitive stuff. My gut is making me scared as opposed to my brain or my asshole is going to keep me from hiccuping. <laughs> Is that what eventually leads to them shitting themselves, right? The, the hiccups? Like yeah. the stimulation of the nerve, the feedback loop, which eventually like fear just leads to me just losing bowels. No, that's actually oh, your body depositing no. all this yeah. stuff so it can get so it ready can for, run faster. Yeah, for, for fight or flight. Yeah, I said no points earlier. I was upset, but I think I'd like to tie this game up and give points to Damien. Oh, four all four. tied up four four. Everybody, get you guys off my back. You can is... start going after each other for a change. <laughs> that will still go after you. It's easier. <laughs> you're <laughs> you're smaller. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad. Thank you. I, the, that was a very wise decision, and I'm going to disagree with everything Miss Stopes has to say next episode. Thank mm -hmm. you. It's very sweet. And if you want to see what's going on with Miss Stopes next episode, tune in to Science Faction 22. For now, thanks for listening to Science Faction 21 with good old Damien Mercado, Jackie, and myself. And let's not forget, Marie Stopes. I'm going to teach you a lesson, Jackie, or we just have to apologize She's first. been here the whole damn time? I was waiting outside. Damien contacted me and said we had a segment together next week. You and me... Pit of KY Jelly, now. Wow, is that a threat or a sexual thing? That's a... Uh... Only to some people in the MRI machine. Get ready for the wedgie, wedgie of your life, bitch. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to Science Faction. Hope to catch you next week. Please refer a friend if you like the show, and we'll talk to you at Science Faction 22. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right.